Hey everyone. Uh, so today is going to be our final day of talking about uh, CNN based applications. We'll come back a little bit at the end of the course to image captioning, which is kind of a cool application that combines um, text data and image data. Um, but um, in any case, um, today we're going to be talking about a couple of topics which I think are both really fun. Um, and so the first one is being able to visualize uh, what CNNs are doing. Um, and then we're going to talk about GANs, um, which are a pretty powerful tool uh, for various applications. Um, and then we'll move on to the next module, um, which is OCR next week. Um, and as a reminder, next Monday is one of our mental health days that we're like designed to replace spring break. Um, so we won't have a class next Monday. Um, we'll pick up uh, with uh, starting to talk about OCR next Wednesday. Okay, uh, so last class I had just kind of uh, barely introduced visualization. Um, and if you remember, the goal of this exercise is to um, understand better what the network detects and also to be able to think about how the network does this. How is the network able to interpret images? Um, and so it's easy enough to think about the inputs um, to a CNN. Um, in most examples, those are going to be RGB images that have three different color channels. Um, and that's you know, easy enough to visualize. Um, we also know how to think about the outputs. Um, and so those are like class labels, and probabilities, the coordinates if we're detecting layouts. Um, but it's a lot harder to think about the hidden layers um, and to be able to really um, visualize what they're doing. Um, and so recall that we can think of the weights that are, are learned by each of the layers as a three-dimensional cube. Um, and um, so we have individual neurons in the spatial dimension, which is like the X, Y, kind of the two-dimensional coordinate system of images, as well as in the channel dimension. And, you know, so I just said, like, for the first layer, kind of the channels of your input are the, like, color channels. Um, but then as you move um, throughout the network, you typically have kind of an increasing number of channels, which are like different filters that try to pull out different features uh, from the images. And so you can think about this cube that has individual neurons, you know, individual weights. Um, but then there's also spatial activations. And so the spatial activations um, are the activations for a given spatial location um, in that image that span across all the different um, filters that you're applying. Um, and remember, you're kind of sliding these filters across the image. You have channel activations. Um, and so, you know, like hypothetically speaking, you could have, you know, a channel or a filter that's um, finding the ears in the cat and another channel that's looking for the nose and one that's looking for the mouth. Um, and then you can also have just more arbitrary groups of neurons. And we can ask, you know, whether that's a meaningful way to think about the data. Um, and so we can use visualization to better understand what different neurons, different spatial positions, channels, or more arbitrary regions of the network um, are looking for in an image. Um, and this figure that I'm showing on this slide, I've pulled, I've pulled this from an article in Distill, in Distill, which is like this amazing kind of interactive um, journal. Um, and this is just a really um, amazing article called The Building Blocks of Interpretability that helps you to kind of understand better um, what neural nets are doing. And, I'd recommend going and checking it out and playing with their interactive visualizations. It's just, um, it's a really cool way to learn this stuff. And I really like the interactive journal format. Um, in some sense, like the fact that like, you know, so take as an example, us in economics, we'll often have, you know, a paper, it's like a static PDF document, and then like a 200 page appendix. And, you know, who wants to, or even can, you know, kind of, digest material in that format. Um, and you'd imagine you could instead kind of have an interactive article where, you know, um, you read it online and, um, 
you know, you can, for different kind of robustness assumptions, you know, have a menu where you change, like, um, you know, what your figures are doing, what your tables are doing, etc. I mean, that's kind of like what this distill does. And so you can choose like different um, visualization applications and then use their kind of interactive tools to see what it's doing. And it's just like a really um, awesome way to learn. Okay. And so the first question is like, how should we even think about visualizing what these hidden layers are doing? Um, and so if we just take the, you know, the raw um, uh, information from the hidden layers, those are just high dimensional numerical vectors. And so like, how do you think about that? Like, you know, how do you think about say a 512 dimensional um, numerical vector? We don't really think that way. Um, and so we wanna be able to symbolize what the network learns. Um, and since it's uh, learning visual representations in the case of CNNs, it makes the most sense to summarize what it's learning also using visual representations. And this sort of extends to other domains. Um, so let's say that you're interested in processing audio. Um, you would want to understand what the network is doing using you know, audio like visualizations or whatever the kind of correct term should be there. Uh, when studying text, it's common for people to use visualizations like word clouds, right? Um, but since this is images, the visualization, it's kind of straightforward that it should be an image. Okay. And so I want to talk about um, most basic visualization approaches, and then I'm going to talk about a method called gradient-based descent. Um, and finally, I'm going to talk about um, this um, a visualization tool from Google called Deep Dream that's mostly just um, a lot of fun, um, but also gives some insights into what these networks are doing. Okay. Um, and so the following figure is taken from the original AlexNet paper. And it visualizes the filters that are applied um, to the inputs. Um, and so at the input layer, it's pretty easy to visualize these filters uh, become, because remember the input is in three channels. Um, and so you can just visualize the height by width by three dimensional filter as a color image. Um, and we know what that means. And we can look at this and it's kind of clear that this that these filters are looking for things like oriented edges, right? Which makes a lot of sense. We know that at the higher levels of the network, it's taking the pixel inputs and kind of trying to pick out the most kind of basic features. Um, and so that's great. Super easy to visualize the weights at the first layer. Um, but what about, you know, what comes after that? Um, so as humans, um, you know, we have um, three cones in our eyes and we visualize things in three channels. Like that's how human vision works. We don't know how to think in 256 channel space. Um, so I've taken like um, an illustration here from a, a, a lecture from the Stanford CS class um, on CNNs. And so um, it's showing you um, weights from AlexNet and the first layer is what we just saw, and that's super easy. We can think about those as color images. Um, but in the second layer, it's again has these um, uh, um, these seven by seven images, but now they're sixteen channels deep because you've applied sixteen filters um, in the first layer, and you're going to apply twenty filters to those. And so what they've done is just to use kind of a, a grayscale image to visualize um, for each of these 20 layers, the 16 seven by seven filters you apply. And then when you move up to the next layer, it's even more kind of grayscale images to visualize each individual uh, filter. And um, as you can see, this is just useless. <laughs> it's like information overload, um, you know, where we're just kind of taking these vectors and like visualizing them as seven by seven. Um, grids, but I don't know, like, you know, what we could possibly um, learn from this. So obviously you don't want to literally take the approach from the first layer and apply it to subsequent layers. We're going to have to be a little bit more clever than that in order to figure out what's going on uh, inside of CNN. Okay, um, so the first um, thing that I want to highlight which is also an insight that comes from the AlexNet paper um, where I took this figure from, is that um, you know, if we were to take the input images and just look at pixel distance, it's like 
not super meaningful because like you say you have a picture of a dog and then you shift the whole thing over to a different part of the image, the pixel distance could be very far, like even though it's the same dog. Um, whereas when you look at pixel distance um, or you look at L2 distance um, in the feature space from the kind of final layer, the final hidden layer of your CNN, that just that distance um, uh, between um, features vectors of an image that's put in um, is very meaningful. Um, and so you can see here um, on the right is a reference image, and then it's looking for um, the images in the AlexNet data set that are closest in the feature space um, from the final hidden layer of AlexNet. And you can see it's picking out things that look very similar, and it's doing so in a way that's like, not trivial. So if you look at the elephants, you know, some of them are facing the left side of the image and some of them are facing the right, you know, those are very different kind of in uh, pixel space for the input image. Um, but when we get to that final features layer of the CNN, and we just take the kind of the simple Euclidean distance between those vectors, um, it, it's giving us something really meaningful. Um, and so kind of that that's um, an, an early visualization insight um, of what these um, deep CNNs are doing. Um, and um, so that final features vector from the CNN is a high dimensional object. You know, again, we can't visualize stuff really as humans in high dimensional space. But the question is, can we project that to two dimensions in a way that meaningfully preserves the semantic concepts that the high dimensional space captures. So we want to take, you know, in this image, they're computing distance in high dimensional space. So like 512 dimensions or however many dimensions the last layer of Alex and is, they're computing distance in that space. But we want to ask, can we take these vectors and project them down into a low dimensional space, say into a two dimensional space in a way that still kind of preserves meaning? Um, and um, so um, I'm going to show you a demo that uses a method called TSNI uh, to project the 4096 dimensional FC7 um, CNN features vectors from an ImageNet classifier into two dimensional space. Um, in practice, there's a, now a more modern method for dimensionality reduction called UMAP um, that we're going to talk about when we get to NLP. Um, but this kind of um, visualization is using the main alternative to that. Um, and so what we're going to do is take the features vectors from the final layer of the CNN for each image that's fed in, project those down to two dimensions, and then visualize the original images at their location in the projected two-dimensional space. Um, and I recommend that you go to this website because this is something that you're not going to really be able to see on a slide. Um, but basically, if we kind of zoom in, you can see that this two-dimensional reduction does seem to be capturing something meaningful. And so kind of in the bottom corner, you're seeing like yellow butterflies and other butterflies kind of near them and then other insects nearby. Um, and so kind of it does seem like, you know, we are able to, one approach is to take these features vectors from the final layer, final hidden layer, which we know are meaningful and project them into a lower dimensional space and then look at kind of like where these images appear. You know, if you were doing NLP, you would do something very similar, except rather than showing images, you'd have a way to show the text. And we'll talk about actually tools that let you do that for NLP. It's gonna be essentially kind of the same method, um, but with text rather than pictures as is shown here. Okay, so that's just kind of a, a basic intuition for visualization. Um, but we can also use kind of more sophisticated approaches. Um, and so remember that when we train a neural net, we choose the weights to minimize a cost function. So suppose instead we've already trained the weights, we've already done that. And instead we want to train the input image to maximize certain neurons in the network. Um, so um, for example, um, <coughs> you could begin by putting in an image of a cat 
and see which neurons light up the most um, and then change the input image to maximize those neurons. Okay. Um, and so this method is called a gradient-based ascent. And so the intuition is that we want to generate an image that maximally activate, activates a given neuron value. And so we're trying to choose an I star that maximizes the neuron value F of that image plus some regularization term, which could be something like the L2 norm of an image. Um, in practice, there are also some additional tweaks that are done during training, like Gaussian blur or clipping pixels with small values and gradients to zero that just help to generate images that are a bit smoother. Okay, so in practice, we start with an image that's initialized to be all zeros. And we pass that image through the CNN to compute the current neuron values. And then we backprop to get the gradient of the neural values with respect to the image pixels. And then we update that image and repeat. Okay, so this is from um, a paper that developed this method in 2015. And essentially they take, you know, a reference image to image net and figure out kind of like which pixel or set of pixels light up when you feed in you know, different kinds of animals or objects. You see here like flamingos, um, pelicans, a billiard table. And then they maximize those neurons. And this is what the input images end up looking like. And you can see kind of um, very clearly that, um, and, and this I should say is on the final layer of the network. So they're saying, okay, in the final hidden features layer, this is the pixels that light up. Um, when we feed in a flamingo, now let's maximize those. What image do we get out? We kind of get out this image where you see like these different uh, pictures of uh, flamingos and the image. Okay, so subsequently we've maximized not just individual neurons, but also spatial locations, channels, or more arbitrary regions. And as I said, go online and check out this uh, paper that's cited here. Um, which kind of um, tries to integrate, you know, the abstractions for visualization that the literature has come up with, with, with rich interfaces and allows you to kind of really experiment um, with, um, with visualizations that are, that are kind of similar to, to what we just saw. Okay, um, so the final thing I want to discuss um, with regards to visualization. And I should say like, actually first, are there any questions about what I just showed? Okay, um, so I wanna talk about another visualization project and this is like mostly just for fun, like, um, but you know, maybe also a little bit informative. Um, and so this is a tool called Google Deep Dream. It was made by some guy at Google who wasn't even doing machine learning stuff, but just did this for fun and like his 5% time um, when Google employees get to kind of work on a fun project. Um, and so the idea is that you compute um, a chosen set of activations at a given layer. Um, you set the gradient of those neurons equal to their activations. And then you compute the gradient on the image and you update the image. And so this algorithm has the um, interpretation that it is amplifying exist existing features that were detected by the network in the image by those particular neurons. And so let's see an example. So let's say um, we um, give this just picture of a sky. Um, to an ImageNet um, trained classifier. And we run this, you know, we iterate, we run it multiple times and it's just kind of like a picture of a sky. There's no kind of ImageNet objects there, but you can see, you know, there's um, potentially, you know, like um, pixels in the image that maybe resemble some objects and you see that it's starting to hallucinate objects, right? Because at each pass of this, you're saying kind of, okay, amplify whatever you think you saw, you know, which is kind of like um, the opposite of what we would normally do. We don't want like the network to do that, but this is informative um, 
for thinking about what it's doing. So at the first stage, it sees this kind of picture of a sky. Okay, now take that. Um, the network maybe saw something with low confidence because it's the first pass, but amplify that. Um, and then do that again and again. And you start to see it hallucinating different types of objects here, you know, different animals or hybrids of animals and maybe some buildings. Um, so this is a fun example that I found online um, in this YouTube video. And so what this guy did was to take ImageNet um, and send in a reference image of a cat. And first of all, look at the final hidden layers and see which neurons fired the most when it saw this cat. So those must be the neurons that are looking for the cat. And then it took this just plain kind of um, landscape image and fed it in and ran Google Deep Dream and see what happened. And you can see it starts to hallucinate cats um, all over this image. There's no cats in this image, but there's maybe, you know, various features that look like, you know, on the first pass, like well, maybe they could be a cat. And so if you amplify the firings of that neuron, those neurons that look for cats, it starts to hallucinate cats. And then he did the same thing with one of the earlier layers. Again, he looked for neurons that fired when he sent in a reference image of a cat, but this is in an earlier layer of the network. And you see now, like instead of hallucinating cats, it's hallucinating just like eyes and fur. Um, and this goes back to an earlier intuition that we had kind of from the very beginning that we think the early layers of the neural net should pick up on things like oriented edges and these very low level features. And then they should put those together in the middle of the network. You could kind of pick up on slightly higher level features and then kind of at the um, final stages of the network, you should be picking up on kind of the full objects that you're trying to detect. And so we see this happening here. If you amplify the cat neurons in the middle of the network, it's recognizing like eyes and fur, um, which tells you that in the middle of like the network is kind of looking for these mid-level features. Okay. Um, there's this kind of fun finding um, when you run um, when you run Deep Dream on an ImageNet trained backbone. Um, you find that it tends to hallucinate these weird animals, um, many of which are like dogs or some kind of um, hybrid between dogs and some other other animals. You see here like the animal dog the dog fish and the camel bird, a pig snail. Um, so why is it doing this? Um, well, something like 120 of the thousand classes in ImageNet are different breeds of dog. Um, and so, you know, if you're running um, this and you're just kind of choosing neurons um, at random to amplify, it's not surprising that they hallucinate dogs because this um, CNN that's been pre-trained on ImageNet has been, you know, primed to look for dogs because when you're running free training on ImageNet, lots and lots of pictures of dogs appear. Um, and so here's just another example. And you can kind of run this at multiple scales and you start to get like kind of these really amazing images. And so this would like feed the image in at different scales and you can get all these different scale dogs and things start to look like um, pretty uh, crazy here. Um, Here's another example of running it, you know, on, on Starry Night. And again, you see it hallucinating these kind of weird um, animals and people in cars. Um, more examples. Okay, so there's this other data set called MIT Places um, that instead of, you know, having lots of animals like on um, uh, like ImageNet, it has just lots of pictures of different places, so like buildings and supermarkets and uh, things like that. Um, so pictures of different places. Um, and when people ran Deep Dream on MIT Places, on a, like a, a backbone that was pre-trained on MIT Places, instead of, you know, like tending to hallucinate lots of different animals, it hallucinates these different um, buildings, which is pretty nuts. You can see it kind of out of Nowhere in this image hallucinating these kind of very elaborate buildings. Um, this is an example where it seems to be um, hallucinating some shelves from a grocery store. Um, you know, so given this, I think that actually one thing that, that, that is kind of amazing is that when we take 
backbones that have been pre-trained on ImageNet, which has nothing to do with things that we probably want to recognize as economists. I'm not, I'm not going to have a paper where I want to recognize different breeds of dogs, right? But like, somehow it doesn't take that much data to fine tune it, to recognize like document structures. And so like, even though it's a pretty different domain, this kind of system of vision that it learns seems to be like very highly transferable, which I think is pretty amazing. You might think ex ante, well, it's gonna take hundreds of thousands of images um, to get this backbone to work on my documents because my documents have nothing to do with dogs and birds, and, you know, other things that appear, but that, that, that's not the case. Somehow you can drastically kind of reduce labeling requirements for fine tuning as compared to like training something like ResNet that's 101 layers from scratch, um, even when the domains are pretty different. Um, and like somehow it's not gonna do that well if you just apply it off the shelf at all, but it doesn't really take that much for it to learn to do better, um, which I think is kind of amazing. Okay, um, so the second thing that I wanna talk about today um, is um, generative adversarial networks or GANs. Um, and these have some really interesting applications. Um, there's a little bit that we've worked on, um, but I think that they actually have a lot of potential um, for further developments as well for the types of applications that we do. Um, and so I think that they're kind of a tool that has not been used very extensively for applications that we as economists are likely to encounter, but I think that they're a really promising area uh, for future work. Okay, and so what I'm gonna do is just kind of give you an introduction to um, uh, the um, kind of the, this broad area, and then I'll talk about um, GANs in general, and then I'm going to talk about a specific flavor of GAN called cycle GAN that I think is particularly kind of promising for these like uh, document applications. Okay, um, so as we've talked about before in this course, there's two general type models that you might want to estimate. So the first thing is a supervised model. And what we mean by supervised is that you're going to provide the model with data and with labels. And your goal is to estimate a function that maps the data to the labels. Um, and so classification, which we spent a lot of time on is an example of this, localization, segmentation, object detection, um, pretty much everything that we've focused on so far in the course is an example of a supervised problem where we have our data and we have the ground truth for a sample of that. Um, and we wanna train a model um, that can do a good job of mapping our data to the ground truth, you know, whether it be classes, uh, coordinates, et cetera, um, uh, for new data that we feed it. Um, and so that's, that's supervised learning. And that's kind of um, a lot of the applications in computer vision. Um, the second type of problem is unsupervised. And so in the context of unsupervised learning, um, we only provide the model with data. We don't provide it with labels. And so, you know, the paradigm of learning and mapping from data to labels no longer makes sense. Instead, what we want to do is just learn some underlying structure that's in the data, some latent structure um, that's going to be helpful um, for answering, you know, whatever question you have in mind. And so the dimensionality reduction that I showed you just earlier today is an example of unsupervised um, learning. We're taking on um, of, of an unsupervised method. We have this kind of complicated space and we're trying to learn this latent structure. In this case, with dimensionality reduction, we're asking what is the axes along which we can project our data to maintain the most variation possible. Um, K-means clustering, um, which some of you guys may have seen before, but we're looking for clusters in our data is another common example of unsupervised learning. Density estimation, which is what we are going to be focused on today. Um, auto encoders, which we haven't talked about yet, but we'll get to uh, later in the course. Okay, um, so generative models 
which is what we're going to be talking about now, are a type of unsupervised model that aims to generate new samples from the same distribution that generates the training data. Um, so in other words, given the distribution of training data, we need to learn the model distribution. And if we do a good job of that, the data that we sample from the generated model distribution will be indistinguishable from real data sampled from that domain. Okay, so there's two ways to do that. We could try to explicitly estimate the density, um, which people have done, but we're not going to talk about that today because I think it's less useful for our purposes. Or we could try to instead learn a way to sample from the data generating process without having to explicitly define it. And this tends out to be, this tends to like be easier. So obviously data generating process can be very complex and it tends to just give us better results. Okay. And so what are applications of generative models? You know, a lot of the well-known applications are in art, such as something called style transfer, where you take an image from one domain and style it to another domain. So you could like take a Van Gogh painting and make it look in the style of a Monet painting. We'll see some examples of this. Um, another application is colorization. So suppose you have some black and white photographs of your great grandmother or taken from an old newspaper or something, and you can use a model to learn, uh, to, 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 make, to convert those into realistic looking colored images. Um, of course, um, you know, most of these art applications are maybe interesting, but probably not so relevant for us as economists. I think though, there are some really relevant applications. And so one that I'm gonna show you towards the end of this lecture is cleaning document backgrounds, which can be super important for cleaning in accurate OCR and for doing better with layout analysis. Um, another is super resolution. So let's say you have some low quality scans. Um, and your OCR is having a hard time with them, can you effectively learn and increase resolution for those? And this is, isn't something that, that, that I have personally worked on yet. So I don't know, you know exactly how well it would work in this domain, but I think it's interesting. Um, data augmentation um, is another kind of promising example, um, you know, because Let's say that you have some training data um, that, that you've labeled, but it's really costly to make those labels. Um, and you need a lot of, a lot of um, labeled documents. If you had a way to generate your documents um, because you understood kind of the density that the actual ones are drawn from, um, then you don't have to manually create labels. So let's say you know, you're trying to, um, do um, OCR kind of on some low resource language. You want to OCR things from like classical Chinese. Um, and it would be way too costly to sit there and label data for every potential character in classical Chinese. But if you could kind of use, let's say a word processor to create documents in classical Chinese and then make those kind of look like your historical documents by passing them through again, um, then that's a way to get labeled data very cheaply. Um, and so again, this is something that, that, that I would like to work on. And I think it's promising, although I don't know um, until, until we try it, whether it actually um, gives acceptable results. But I, I think that the promise is there. Okay, so if you wanna learn more about generative models, I've linked here um, a tutorial um, by in, Goodfellow, who was the lead author, kind of on the first GAM paper. Um, and you, um, you see here, like, that, you know, you can have either explicit density or implicit density models. And we're not going to talk about the explicit ones. But if you're interested, go check it out. We're going to talk about a type of implicit density that in practice has become kind of by far the most common generative model used in the literature, um, which is, is GAMs. Okay. Um, are there any questions at all about what I've introduced so far? Okay. 
So now I want to um, uh, provide an introduction to what hands are. Um, so recall that our motivation is to be able to sample from the training data distribution, which is um, some kind of complex high dimensional object. And so one approach would be to try to estimate it or approximate it because there may not be any kind of kind of closed form solution for it. Um, the problem with doing this is this, this can be slow and like really difficult. Um, and so GANs use a different approach that turns out to actually be much more tractable and really powerful. So they say like, okay, so it's like hard and it's super computationally costly and kind of brittle to try to actually estimate the density that like estimate the data generating process. Um, so what if we instead, we just sample from a simple distribution that's trivial to sample from. So we just sample from a random noise distribution, a Gaussian, a uniform, um, and then learn a model that can transform a sample from the simple distribution to a sample that looks as though it could be drawn from the training distribution. And of course, this is going to be a complex um, transformation to transform something that's just like, you know, uh, uh, like random noise into an image that is indistinguishable um, from data drawn from our actual distribution. But we can, we know how to model this uh, complex transformation. Um, we do that with a neural network. Okay, and I think that this is like, I mean, we, like, I, I think that studying the deep learning literature is just super instructive because it's an area that's been like incredibly productive, right? And there are so many applications of this in the real world. It's just been enormously kind of successful, kind of all the most cited papers saying Google Scholar um, in recent years are deep learning papers. This is a literature that's had enormous success. And when you look at the papers that, that have been enormously influential, um, it's always because they found a way to take a problem that would be basically intractable and they looked at it from a different perspective. Um, and um, I think like to us ex ante, it can seem almost trivial because like once you see the problem from that perspective, you're like, oh yeah, that, that's really straightforward. I get that. Um, but obviously ex ante, it's just um, very challenging because there's so many unproductive ways um, to approach a difficult problem. And like, how do you find that kind of one particular perspective that happens to be very productive? Um, but it's, it's really cool um, when people do that. And I think GANs are a, a great example. Okay, so how do we, how would we train? Remember, so I've said like, okay, so the goal is we want to sample images from our data generating process, but it's too hard and brittle to try to actually kind of estimate what the, what the distribution of the data generating process is. So instead, we're just gonna sample some random noise um, and then we're gonna convert that. Um, into an image that looks as though it could be drawn from our training data distribution. Um, and so like, that's an interesting insight. Okay, but how on earth do we actually, how, how do we set up that network? Like, how do we estimate that network in practice? Um, and this is a really cool insight. Um, and so the idea is that you can use a game theoretic approach um, between two different adversarial networks to in order to estimate this complex transformation. And so you have a generator network and that generator network, um, and you have a discriminator network. And so the generator network is trying to fool the discriminator network by generating images that look like the real ones. And the discriminator network tries to distinguish real and fake images. And so let's say that you're um, real and you have a bunch of real images of dogs. And so the goal of the generator network is going to be try to try to convert this, you know, random noise image into an image that looks like a dog. And it looks so much like a dog, that the discriminator network cannot tell 
if it is a fake dog or a real dog, right? So the, this discriminatory network is essentially just a classifier that's saying real or fake. Um, and so this is like a zero sum, a zero sum game uh, between the generator and the discriminator. Um, okay, so as I said, the discriminator is just the classification network. We'll talk about exactly what the generator looks like in a minute. Um, and so when the discriminator when the discriminator successfully identifies um, real versus fake images, its model parameters are not changed, but the generator is penalized with large updates to its model parameters. Or alternatively, when the generator fools the discriminator, no change is needed to the generator's parameters, but the discriminator's parameters are updated. Um, and at the limit, you know, if we um, were able to train this to um, perfection, uh, the generator would produce perfect re replicas um, and the discriminator would always predict a class score of 0 0.5 for real and 0 0.5 for fake. So the discriminator knows that it can't tell the difference um, because these um, fake images are um, perfect, um, you know, counterfeits of the actual images. Okay, so specifically, we modeled this as a two-player uh, minimax problem. Um, that you see here. And so the theta Gs are the parameters of the generator network, which is going to be a neural net. And the theta Ds are the parameters of the discriminator network. Um, and D here is the likelihood of that, of the, the likelihood that the image is real. Um, and so this um, Dx is the discriminator output for real data X and the D of G of Z is the discriminator output for fake data, uh, G of Z, the data that's um, generated by uh, the generator. And to maximize the objective, the discriminator wants um, dx close to one. So it wants to say with high probability that the real data are real. And d of g of z um, close to zero, it wants to um, be able to say with high probability um, the generated data are not real. Um, to minimize this objective, the generator wants d of g of z to be close to one um, so that that um, second term um, will disappear. Um, and so in other words, the goal of the generator is to fool the discriminator. And so in order to train this, what you could do is alternate between a gradient ascent on the a uh, discriminator and gradient descent on the generator and practice this doesn't actually work so well because the gradient of D of G of Z is flat when we have bad samples and only becomes steep when the generator is doing a pretty good job. And so instead we just flip the function and match the likelihood of the discriminator being wrong. Okay, so this is specifically um, the algorithm used kind of taken from the original GAN paper. Um, and so you're going to sample a mini batch of noise samples from some noise prior um, and um, sample a mini batch of examples from your actual data. Um, and then you're going to update the discriminator by ascending its stochastic gradient. Um, and then you're going to switch um, sample a mini batch of noise samples and update the generator by ascending the, uh, its stochastic gradient. Um, and so how do we, what does this kind of mean in practice? What do these architectures actually look like? Um, and so the generator is an upsampling network with fractionally stratic convolutions. And so you start with this low resolution noise image and you upsample it um, using convolute, like these um, fractionally stratic convolutions, which we saw um, earlier in the class when we were talking about um, uh, segmentation, um, you use those fractionally stratified convolutions to upsample it into an image that can fool the discriminator. And the discriminator is just a cognet that looks like the classified, the cognet for classifications that we've seen. The discriminator is just trying to say, is it real or is it fake? Um, and so there's a paper here that I've cited um, I clear 2016 um, that gave some practical tips that end up making a pretty big difference to the performance of GANs. Um, and so um, 
In the discriminator, you don't want to have pooling layers. Remember, we saw some architectures have pooling layers. You want to use stridic convolutions, um, which is something that we kind of saw more generally, right? When we were talking about advancement and the ImageNet competition, that these stridic convolutions are useful. Um, and for the generator, um, you upsample using fractional with stridic convolutions. Um, you want to use batch norm for both the generator and discriminator. Um, you don't want fully connected hidden layers for deep architectures. That's kind of already something that we saw, say, with the development of ResNet. You want to use ReLU activations for all layers of the generator, except for the output, which uses TNH, um, and use leaky ReLU in the discriminator for all layers. Um, so um, in this example, you're starting um, with just um, a hundred dimensional uniform distribution and you're projecting that to a small spatial extent. Um, so this looks like it's four by four, but it has a lot of depth. Um, so 1024. Um, and then you're usually using these fractional stridate or transpose convolutions to upsample it, um, but um, reduce um, the number of channels. Um, and you keep doing that until you get to the desired size. So in this case, a 64 by 64 image. And the final image, you know, is going to have um, three channels for the three color channels. And so this is what the generator is doing. And you're just estimating um, the parameters on these, on these fractionally stridic convolutions, which it's showing you there in gray, um, that are getting kind of spreaded across, um, just like we saw. Um, a minute ago. Okay, and so this is from the original Gantt paper. And so on the right in yellow is the, um, I believe the training data and then it's generating, kind of generating these images. So you can see they're not great, um, but it is like kind of generating something that looks like the training data. Um, but when you take those modifications that I just mentioned from the Redford paper, um, in this case, it's starting with random noise. And these are pictures of bedrooms that it's generated. And you can see it's like doing pretty good, um, impressively good. Um, and in general, like I took this um, just from a blog post online, you can see over a relatively short period, there's this explosion of GAN papers and they do dramatically better from, um, you know, going to like in the 2017 example, um, generating an image that really looks like an actual um, person. Okay, so that's a general introduction to um, GANs, um, but I wanna talk about a specific a uh, flavor of GAN called cycle GAN that I think is particularly useful for our applications. But um, before I get there, does anyone have um, any questions? Okay. Um, and so cycle GAN is a model that can take an image from one domain and generate a synthetic version of the image with a specific modification. And so the most famous example of cycle GAN, which comes from the original paper and is kind of like a cycle GAN benchmark, um, is converting horses into zebras or zebras into horses. Um, and so you see um, that example here. And the idea is you can, you've trained a network where you can put in a picture of a zebra and it gives you a picture of a horse or alternatively, you can put in a picture of a horse and it gives you a picture of a zebra. Um, so that's like one kind of presumably useless, but um, uh, a classical example. Um, you know, another example is turning, changing the seasons, taking a picture of a given location and switching the season from winter to summer or summer to winter. You see that in the upper right or taking like paintings. Um, and converting them into photographs or taking photographs and converting them into paintings. And you can do that with different styles. So here you see a photograph um, and um, networks trained kind of on different target domains can convert that photograph on into images that have very different styles. Okay. Um, and the really important thing about cycle GAN 
is that you don't need paired data. Um, and so on the left, you see an example of a, you know, a model that's trying to take sketches of something and color them in to the full objects. Um, and if you need pair data to do that, you need like the sketch of the shoe and the actual shoe. Um, but with CycleGAN, you don't need that. You can just have a data set of, let's say, let's say we want to do the thing where we turn um, uh, photographs into paintings. You can have um, just a data set of places and then a data set of paintings of totally different places. And that's fine. You don't need them to be paired. And this is really important because pre, like collecting paired data could either be costly or just downright impossible, like for a lot of our applications. And so this, I think, makes this a much more kind of applicable uh, framework. Okay, so how does, what's the architecture of CycleGAN? Um, CycleGAN simultaneously trains two generator models and two discriminator models. So one generator takes images from the first domain and outputs images for the second domain. And the other generator takes images from the second domain as an input and generates images for the first domain. So like if you're into like trying to train a model to do the zebras to horses task, you know, one of your generators would take a picture of a zebra and turn it into a horse and try to fool that discriminator. And another uh, generator model would take your picture of a horse and turn it into a zebra, right? So it goes in both directions. Um, an important part of CycleGAN, which is where the cycle in the name comes from, is that if you put an image um, output by the first generator into the second generator, it should return the original image. So if you convert a horse into a zebra, and then you take that generated image of a zebra and you put it into the zebra to horse converter, um, the model aims to return the original horse. Um, and so in order to do this, CycleGAN adds a loss term that measures this discrepancy uh, going in both directions. So this is analogous to um, how we do text translation between languages. And so if you're trying to um, uh, train a model that translates English into French, um, you would have a cycle consistency on it that if you translate that French back into English, it should be the same place. Um, and um, so we can think of CycleGAN as essentially a model that allows us to translate between different styles or different visual languages um, that are used in images. Okay, so this is just a picture of the architecture from the original paper. And so you see here, um, you have um, two um, generators, F and G. So one takes uh, domain X and translates it to Y. And the other one takes domain Y and translates it to X. And then you have two discriminators for each of those generators. And then you have the cycle consistency going both ways. And so if you put um, X into G and get Y hat and then put it into F, you get X hat. And you, the cycle consistency loss is the difference between X and X hat. Analogously, analogously if you put Y into F, to generate x hat and then you put x hat into g you get y hat back and the difference between y and y hat is the cycle consistency loss in the other direction so you'd have a cycle consistency loss for horses to zebras and a cycle consistency loss for zebras to horses um and so the generator models are deep convolutional gans um implemented using multiple residual blocks so essentially Kind of using this ResNet like architecture. Um, and the discriminators use something called patch GAN, um, which tries to classify whether patches of the images are real or fake. And it runs convolutionally across the image, and then all the responses are averaged. And so this patch size is a hyperparameter that you have to choose. And I think in our practice, up to a point, smaller patches are better, um, but you need to experiment with that. Um, and so in the original paper, and I think probably in the code base that implements it, they, they use ADAM and the low learning rate for 100 epochs, and then an additional 
100 epochs with a learning rate decay. Um, and there's a batch size of one, which means you update after every image. Okay, so I want to show you some examples and I'll take examples from the original paper and then I'm gonna take you know, an example um, that, that, um, uh, that Jake produced when estimating uh, cycle GAN. So you can see it actually applied to our domain because you might think that like, you know, why do I care about uh, turning zebras into horses? Um, so these are some examples um, from the original paper. You see the classic, you know, um, horse to zebra and zebra to horse, um, winter to summer, summer to winter, apples to oranges, oranges to apples. Okay, these are domains that it works well for. We're going to talk in a minute about domains where it doesn't work so well. Um, this is using it for something called style transfer. Um, which is essentially translating an image into different styles. And so here's photographs and um, translated into the styles of different artists, um, which is pretty cool. Um, and I should say there's like a, been an explosion of like artists using GANs to make just really um, interesting and cool artwork. And I think, you know, um, artists who have kind of the technical background are really interested in doing experimental things. So there's been some really um, cool work um, for any of you that enjoy art. Um, paintings to photos. Um, so you can also go the other way, start with a painting and ask what a photograph would look like. Um, another thing is photo editing. And so um, you can see the left and the right. And so if you wanna get the image on the right, which kind of um, puts the emphasis on your subject and blurs the background. In order to do that with like a traditional camera, that's a combination of your aperture, which is how much light the lens lets in, your focal length and your distance from the subject, um, which, um, you know, it can be hard to get a good photograph because first of all, you need an expensive camera um, that has the appropriate kind of aperture um, and a focal length that may be pretty big and bulky, and then you have to be standing in a particular position. Um, and so, like maybe if you guys have like a the mo like or one of the more recent iPhones, um, you notice that it has portrait mode, where it's just like a cheap kind of cell phone camera, um, but it can do that blur. And like I'm sure how it does that is proprietary, but I think it has to be kind of something like this. Um, where um, they've um, figured out kind of like an algorithm that can blur the background. And so this is kind of cool because it lets you get these kind of really um, maybe more powerful photographs that, that focus on your subject with a cheap camera, like the camera that's in an iPhone and you don't have to um, buy really expensive equipment. And so this is just another example of like kind of how this may um, enter your everyday life. Um, but we can also use this in our research. Um, and so this is um, an example of um, a document taken from firm level Japanese reports. And we had a year of this publication that we were interested in for our research in 1957. Um, but the best scan that we could get, the paper is really thin and old and like they had to send it to a company to be scanned. And so you get this really bad text feed. Um, that you see in the top column where you can see the characters coming through like from the other side of the page. Um, and you know, one approach would be to use rule-based methods and get rid of this with some kind of thresholding. Um, but that actually doesn't work so well because in the actual characters, you also have thin stroke widths or maybe pretty faint. And so if you try to get rid of the text bleed just using like a threshold pixel value or an adaptive threshold to get rid of part of the characters and your OCR will still be garbage. Um, and by the way, as we'll see, OCR software is gonna binarize this image before it does OCR. So this text bleed is it's common in historical documents and it can cause a lot of problems. Um, but we also had a different kind of later year of the publication that had kind of the same font and similar layouts, um, but it was a very clean scan. It didn't have text bleed in the background. And so like in this case, our horses and zebras um, were the year of the publication that we wanted to use um, that has a lot of text bleed 
And then the same publication, but from a later year, a different quality of scanner that looks pretty clean. Um, and we're able to use um, the cyclogan um, to get rid of, you know, um, to get rid of the text data. You know, you can still see in places like a little tiny bit coming through, but it's like dramatically better. And so that second image is, you can see like it's the exact same image. It has the same characters. All the characters are still there, but it's gotten rid of the text bleed. Um, and it's kind of, it's, it's really amazing. You would not be able to do this with a rule-based approach. And so I find it just actually um, pretty remarkable that it could figure out how to do this because the human brain is good at it. Um, but when you, you try to use a, any kind of like thresholding, like even if it's adaptive, it's just not that good. And so I think that this is like, um, this is pretty remarkable. Okay, but you know, um, we also need to talk about where this fails. And so there's different reasons it can fail. Um, and so the first reason could just be distributional features of training data. Um, so you see here, like there's Vladimir Putin riding a horse and we wanna convert that horse into a zebra. Um, and you can tell this is just a, a disaster. Um, so what's gone wrong? Um, well, um, when the paper um, trained Cyclogan to convert horses into zebras and zebras into horses, it used horses and zebras in the wild. And so the training data was never exposed to a sample where somebody's riding a horse. And so it really has no idea what to do when it sees this and it kind of just does the best it can. But you can see it's, it's, it's turning Putin into a zebra and kind of getting confused and turning the background a bit into a zebra. And this is just kind of like not working at all. And so like um, you, you need to make sure that like kind of your, when you're drawing a sample, it's from kind of a part of the distribution that is spanned by your training data or otherwise um, you might get bad results. Um, and the other thing that this really uh, fails at is geometric transformations. And so in all the examples I showed you, um, it was really about color changes and like texture changes, right? And so if you go here to our document, it's really about a color change, right? It's getting rid of that text data. It's converting that color. Um, and then like these, you know, converting this photograph into um, art. Again, it's, you know, changing the color palette and it's kind of changing the textures um, to make it look more like a painting and less like a photograph. Um, but if you want to convert a dog into a cat, like dogs and cats have different geometries. You can't just change like the texture or the color. In fact, you know, on average, dogs and cats may have similar textures and colors, but we know something's a dog and something's a cat because it has a different uh, geometry. Um, and Cyclogan does not um, do a good job of uh, transforming the geometry. So this is from the paper. And if it, you try to turn a dog into a cat, it just, it just, it just can't do that. And it just kind of um, outputs basically an identity transformation. And this is the, the authors say it's kind of true in general with their experimentations. And so in the context of kind of documents, like I haven't tried this, but I suspect if you had very different fonts, right, those have different shapes and it might struggle. Um, but I think that um, it could do a good job, perhaps, of changing the texture of the fonts, um, which is kind of important because let's go back to our example where we would like to simulate historical documents, um, but we can't just you know, do that with a word processor um, because the printing technology was very different. And so we need to like find a font, I think that kind of looks like the historical font. Um, but one thing that's gonna be very different about the historical document is it used a printing press. And so it's gonna have variable stroke width of that font, which is kind of like a textural feature. And it might have like variable backgrounds that like age and yellow. And that's also something, you know, that you could simulate with a GAN. And so I think that Kind of in that context, if you're thinking about like simulating data for labels, you want to think about like, um, is there a way to frame the problem so that I need to change kind of the texture and the colors of this generated document to make it look like kind of the documents that I'd like to simulate to have to be able to kind of simulate labeled data, 
um, versus something that's going to require you to transform like shapes, um, which I think is probably not going to work. <laughs>